Amadeus Creative is in conjunction with Seleucia University presents Conversations on the Law. Greetings, my dear friends. It's good to be back. As promised, last time we did discuss business and we went into a definition of what business was. And today we want to look at a definition of the law. What is law? You know, this is a, a very simple question. But uh, as I mentioned last week or the week before, it would take uh, four years of study just to go through what is law. Professor Lon Fuller, one of uh, the naturalists uh, in English law, as quoted by Professor Maduku, one of our leading uh, academics in Zimbabwe, had this to say, definitions of law we have in almost unwanted abundance. But when law is compared with morality, it seems to be assumed that everyone knows what the law is and what the second term in comparison embraces. Now, this is not so easy a definition of what the law is. So we want to look at what the law is and what morality is. Now, this is a debate that Professor Fuller and Professor Hart, Herbert Hart, have heard for years and you can go through the internet, there is a plethora, there is so much, so much material that you can go through. But uh, Professor Maduku then, in differentiating this, puts in this interesting concept. And he says, the law refers to rules and regulations that govern human conduct or other societal relations and particularly are enforceable by the state. It is the quality of enforceability that makes the law the law. When the law is enforced by the state, that's what distinguishes it from other rules. And this can be zeroed down to basically three elements. Maduku's uh, definition of the law can be zeroed down to number one, the objects, that would be the regulations, and the rules that govern the people. Number two, the subject, which is the human conduct in a society. And number three, the enforcer, who then enforces these rules and regulations. Now, from a rules and regulations perspective, when rules and regulations are enacted and applied and observed, all things being equal, desired human conduct in a society shall exist. Now, let's go back and express it in a formulaic format as we did with business. So what this would simply drive at is that Enacted rules and regulations applied and observed is equal to desired human conduct in a given society. Now, we want to think and say at the back of our minds, is there a society that is 100% rule abiding? A society that is 100% um, regulation observing? Is this possible? We also went on uh, as we did a bit of comparison as we're looking at our research. And we said, as far as research is concerned, there are independent variables and dependent variables. Now, if we were to contextualize this in the context of business law, we would say, therefore, what it means is that human conduct in a society is a dependent variable. It is dependent on the independent variable, which is the law. So the law influences human conduct. Now, um, would all jurists agree with this frame, framing? Maybe not. The, the, this thesis might not be accepted wholesale. Some would say it is the human conduct which shapes the laws. So we now need to then have a, a balance of some sort between the laws influencing human conduct and vice versa. Now, this is not um, a, a course in jurisprudence, a, a study of what the law is because um, many of these juries hold different ends of the stick on, on these particular questions. But the five most important questions that I would want us to consider, maybe uh, for today we'll look at the first three or so, and then in our next session we'll look at the last two as follows. Question number one, who makes these rules and regulations? That is what would be of interest to us. Number two, where do we find them? Number three, to whom do they apply? Number four, where they apply to me, do I always have to obey them? 
Now we're going back to the issue of human conduct. And lastly, where I'm not happy with these laws, how do then I change these laws? Now let us address these and begin at number one on rule making. Now, as far as the Zimbabwean law is concerned, rulemaking is a function of the legislature. And the legislature is comprised of parliament and the president. This is in terms of the constitution, and you'll find this in section 116. The other arm that makes the laws is the common law or the judiciary. And how does it make these laws? We are going to look at this later on. But for now, we want to look at the law as it is legislated, passed by Parliament and the President. How then does this law come into effect? Now, to begin with, the Parliament is going to sit and pass a law, but until that law is signed into law by the President and gazetted, it does not become law. So in essence, Parliament and the President work together to bring laws into existence. And they do this in terms of section 116 and section 117. We'll look at sections two, um, I mean, um, paragraph two and items B and C. So sections 117, paragraph two, items B and C. This is what it has to say. The legislative authority confers the legislature and parliament and the president, the power to make laws for the peace, order, and good governance of Zimbabwe and to confer subordinate legislative powers upon another body or authority in accordance with section 134. We shall look at section 134 later on. But what I want to stress is that the deliverables of parliament is to set laws that are meant to achieve three key pillars. Number one, order. Number two, good governance. And number three, peace. Now, I didn't name them in any particular order, but the, the proper sequence would be peace, order, and good governance. Now, we looked at um, acronyms that you can use. Now, let me propose an acronym. So, how did I get this into my mind? I said it's POG, P-O-G, peace, order, and good governance. So, if, if you just put it that way, it'll be easy for you to understand the deliverables of Parliament as far as the law is concerned. Now, all these, as they are being done, we're going to realize that they are all coming through the corridor of the Constitution. They are all going to be uh, mirrored and even um, sandwiched by the Constitution. And next, we want to look at that, you know, Parliament does not always make all the laws, but it can also delegate some of these laws to subordinate authorities that will make these laws in terms of section 134. Now let us move over to section 134 as we look at how these will then regulate human conduct in society. Peace, order, and good governance. P-O-G. When Parliament um, delegates the function of lawmaking to a subordinate authority, this could be um, a minister, it could be the president, it could be um, a municipality. These would make what are known as statutory instruments or bylaws. These are made in terms of section 134 of the contract or of um, the constitution, not of the contract. Now, if you look at uh, section C, I mean 134 item C in that particular section, it then states that statutory instruments shall be made and be consistent with the Act of Parliament under which they are made. So the statutory instruments and the bylaws must always be in tandem with the Act of Parliament that brings them into existence. They cannot be contrary, they cannot oppose this Act that brings them into existence. It's like your parent-child kind of a relationship. You cannot have a situation where a child is in opposition to their parents under normal circumstances. But um, for us to use the technical jargon, what this is referred to is being intra-vias. 
intravirus. So it must always um, accord to, align itself with the act of parliament. And the opposite is where it is opposing, it is known as being ultra-vires. Some would say intra-vires, so, so, so that you will get it anyway. It's, it's, it's not our language, but um, the English equivalent is they must be an agreement at all times. And this is also true of the Constitution and the Parent Act. Now, when you look at the Constitution, I think it's close, I mean, Section 2 of the Constitution makes it clear that the Constitution is the Supreme Act. Any other law, whether it is a statutory instrument or it is um, an Act of Parliament or it is a customary law or a conduct or practice, any of those things that is inconsistent with the Act is not going to be a valid law. And Section 134, before we leave that, also provides as follows, that in the event that there is a statutory instrument, the statutory instrument cannot take away, cannot limit a fundamental right in terms of the Constitution. So th this is common sense, because if an act does not limit a fundamental right, therefore it follows that a statutory instrument cannot limit a fundamental right. The fundamental rights can only be limited in terms of the Constitution. So this particular consistency is what is expected of both the statutory instruments and the parent acts. They must be in tandem with the Constitution. Now, the interesting thing is that this particular obligation that the Constitution imposes, it does not impose it upon... Um, uh, a unique set of people. It imposes it upon the generality of the people. If you look at uh, Section 2, uh, Paragraph 2 of the Constitution, this is what you're going to find. And uh, Subsection 2, they, uh, I think it says, the obligations imposed by this Constitution are binding on every person, natural or juristic. Now, here's the interesting thing now. So you remember us discussing and we said, we as human beings are natural people. Companies are juristic persons. So the constitution creates obligations that we do not have to accept. Like it or not, they are imposed on us. So it's not like a contract that has to have an offer and an acceptance. We're going to look at that when we get to our contract law. But this particular obligation by virtue of being a human being within the borders of Zimbabwe, by virtue of being an entity registered within Zimbabwe or operating in Zimbabwe, the constitution applies to you. And not only does it apply to natural persons and juristic persons, but it equally applies to the state, the executive, the legislative, which is parliament and the president. It would also apply to judicial institutions, which we're going to look at later on in greater detail. So in a nutshell, where do we get the law? Who makes the law? It is parliament plus the president giving us the legislature in terms of sections 116 and section 117 of the constitution. Now let us roll over to common law as the other feature that turns out these laws and regulations. Generally speaking, there is very little of our legal environment that is not legislated. Now, you're going to find that there is almost a law for everything. Uh, you would actually have a hard time keeping up with the laws that govern or regulate the conduct of uh, humanity in a given society. Now, common law buttresses, basically it um, covers some of those areas that are either grey or that are not clearly covered by legislation. So the law, as uh, articulated by common law, we get this um, law being handed down by judges, uh, magistrates, um, you know, as they sit and decide cases, they make the law. And in the English law, that is what is called judge-made law or judicial decisions in general. So this is where we would get 
the law primarily for our time as it is. But under common law, you would also get the law as it was assimilated and incorporated into Zimbabwean law from Dutch law, Roman Dutch law as it applied in the Cape of Good Hope in the 1800s. But um, for now, because we're not going to be going deeper into the law, but we want to appreciate the principles of the law, we're going to spend more time on the other leg, which is on judicial decisions. Now, in arriving at these judicial decisions, we need to appreciate that the judiciary has a responsibility. Now, when we looked at uh, the legislature, we said their responsibility, their deliverable, their key performance indicator is to set up laws that are going to deliver and ensure peace, order, and good governance, POG. Now, as far as the judiciary is concerned, in addition to this, yes, the judiciary can be concerned with peace, order, and good governance, but over and above that, the judiciary seems to be um, behooved to be tasked with um, the responsibility of ensuring the delivery of justice, the delivery of justice. So while the legislature and the judiciary would um, uh, be the body of the law, um, the judiciary does not have uh, the arms within we, with which to uh, execute and make sure the law gets done. So we now talk about the arm of the law. So the state gives the, 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 the judiciary a means of making sure that the laws and orders that it gives are complied with. But over and above all, the judiciary has a responsibility to protect the rights of the people, to deliver on justice. And when the state now carries out the orders of the judiciary, it will basically either protect or arrest the people. Now, where does this come from? When the judiciary ensures that someone is uh, brought before the court at least within two days, they must have appeared before a magistrate and at least known their charge. You cannot be held incarcerated without a charge indefinitely. So the judiciary will make sure that you get a swift hearing. So that is a procedural aspect of justice. As it delivers on justice, there are two legs on which justice stands. The left leg would be procedure, and the right leg would be the substantive justice. Now, what is substantive justice? This is the content, the material that justice is made of. So now we're looking at the human rights, the right to life, the right to dignity, the right not to be discriminated, whether on sexual grounds or, or, or any other grounds. Um, by the way, sexual orientation is not um, a right in terms of the Zimbabwean constitution, by the way. But all these rights that are protected and enshrined in the law, the judiciary has to make sure that nobody, going back to close number two, whether it's a natural person, a juristic person, or the state, or the executive, or the legislature, infringes on those rights. So it, it, it plays the referee, basically. So when you are in a work environment, this is where now you're going to be looking at your unfair labor practice between the employer and the employee. The judiciary comes in to regulate that kind of a relationship. When you're looking at the state and the governed, the judiciary will still come in under public law to regulate that. When you look at um, your relations between supplier and, um, and uh, your, your other entities, the judiciary will come in in terms of contract law or business law, as it were. So in a nutshell, the judicial decisions have become uh, a subject of legislation, basically. There is very little room where the judiciary is going to um, generate a new scope, develop the common law freely, but it is only as it fills in the gaps, as it interprets, interprets uh, legislation that we come to understand clearer what the law is. So I, I would like to visualize legislation and the judiciary as um, uh, partners, comrades in um, delivering on both POG and justice. So these are partners, whether it be it is going to be through acts, uh, statutory instruments, or through um, judgments. We're going to find these as we look at um, the sources of the law. So these cannot be 
at loggerheads. Actually, they, they play a complementary function. So as, as we go now to the next question that we want to address, where do we find the law? So on the sources of the law, we're going to find ourselves going back to the same acts, the statutory instruments, and the judgments as some of the sources of the law. So let's quickly move over to sources of the law. We have already referenced um, the acts, statutory instruments, as um, you know, byproducts of rulemaking. This is where the law would come from. Now, it is coming into existence as per the actions of Parliament and the President, or a delegated function of a minister or an executive. So, basically, the Act and the statutory instruments are the primary sources of the law. So, if the question is, what is the law? The first place you want to go and check is, is there an Act that provides or regulates conduct in this particular area? Or, not only would you want to limit yourself to the Act, you could have the Act give you the general scope, but you'd also want to look at a statutory instrument that would then give finer details, uh, further develop um, the, the, the parameters and uh, give you more detail on what the operationalization of the Act would mean. So that would be your statutory instrument. And so when you look at these sources of the law, where do you find acts? Where do you find statutory instruments? You can get these from government printers. You can get these even from the government website, from parliament. You can get them even from um, the ministries where some of these uh, instru instruments would have uh, emanated from. But basically, the acts and the statutory instruments are the primary laws of the country. And both these, the act and the instrument, have equal force at law. Uh, provided they have been um, uh, gazetted and provided they have been passed constitutionally and procedurally. So those are going to become the law. They are the law. The other thing I would also want to stress is that um, you'll notice that I've only mentioned two types. I've said they're acts and statutory instruments. Now you'd ask the question, what about the constitution? Now, the Constitution is also an act of Parliament. Even though it is a different act, it is um, the act of all acts, basically. So what the Constitution is, is a law. Now, let's try and differentiate it this way. This is how Matuk put it. The acts of Parliament are a result of Parliament that is um, uh, set up after elections in a plebiscite, in um, uh, an election. So we select members of parliament. So what members of parliament are, basically they are an extension of the constituencies where they come from. So if the question would be asked, who makes the law? One would say it's parliament. But one would say it's not parliament because parliament is comprised of representatives of the constituents. So it's the entire nation that makes these laws. So when members of parliament go there, they are representing you and I. So whatever they do, they do in our behalf. So we make the laws, basically, through the parliament, through the members of parliament. So they are functionaries of the constituencies they come from. Now, that besides, how then is the constitution made? Members of parliament do not necessarily make the constitution. It is the generality of the populace, the nationals, the residents, the citizens of the country who make the constitution. So parliament makes law on behalf of the constituency and the constituency makes the constitution for itself, even though it's going to go through the stages of being approved and assented to and all those stages. But ultimately, it is the law as it is directly made by the people. And yet... Acts and uh, statutory instruments, I mean, acts in particular, are the law as they are made indirectly by the people. And statutory instruments are going to be the law as it is made by proxies of the institutions that are set in place by the people. Why do I say so? Because a minister in this case would uh, be discharging his function on behalf of parliament. Which parliament is discharging its functions as per our decision to set it in place. 
So when we come to delegated legislation, this is where now uh, we've already referred to this and we're going to say, go back to section 134 and acquaint yourself with those statutory instruments. And particularly in the work environment, you're going to find that it is more of the statutory instruments that are going to affect business more than the acts of parliament, more than the constitution maybe. Give you an example of uh, some statutory instruments um, that have affected business. You know, um, trading and uh, multi-currency, that is a statutory instrument issue. Um, the goods that you can uh, bring in duty-free, that is a statutory instrument issue. So all these um, are aspects of business that cannot be discharged uh, efficiently outside the statutory provision. And secondly, for us to wait for Parliament to sit, convene, and then make these decisions, it may take too long for, for business. Uh, remember, Zimbabwe is open for business. So it can only be statutory instruments that can give us that uh, openness. So now let's look at how one would then cite these uh, laws, how one would cite these statutory instruments if you were to refer to them. Now let us quickly roll over to that section. There are three basic conventions in citing acts. Um, even though you could uh, say it doesn't matter, as long as you understand what I mean, it, it does not always follow. You know, in, in a study of the law, there is no time for us to be discovering and trying to figure out what you say. So when we reference acts, it has to be clear what we are referring to and which acts we are referring to. There are many of them that would have been... Um, Past, I've not um, given myself time, maybe time allowing, just to figure out how many acts have been passed in Zimbabwe since 1980. Um, you, you could discover that there are just too many of them. So there is need for us to be uh, precise when we refer to acts. And as, as I was checking on the Companies and Other Businesses Act, I then realized that um, actually I, I, I made a mistake in our previous video that um, act which I refer to as COPIA 2020 is COPIA 2019 because it was actually gazetted, I think it was on the 15th of November 2019. So I do not know how I got 2020 in there. Now, you could uh, refer to such an act uh, using the long title. The long title is what refers to the chapter. Now you'll notice that where you find this act written in full, it will be Companies and Other Businesses Act, open brackets, I mean, uh, your big brackets, close brackets, 24. That means it's chapter 24. So this is one of the conventional ways that are used in Zimbabwean law. Now, there's a second one, which is the one I love, maybe I love being unique. This one is the one I love, it's the English one. Um, there's a shorter version. The shorter version is where you're going to have just the name of the, comp uh, of the act, and the year in which it came into existence. So if we were to use the same Companies Act, it would, be, it would become Companies and Other Businesses Act, comma, 2019. Remember, comma, 2019. So in Zimbabwean law, take note, there must always be a comma before the year. In English law, they drop the comma. So it, it would just be Companies and Other Businesses Act 2019. I think it's the lazy way to do it, but it's more convenient. Uh, so for the purposes of our discussion, we will not even say Companies and Other Businesses Act. This way we're going to say COPIA 2019 so that you just know this, this acronym refers to the Companies Act of 2019. Now, the third um, approach is where you do not have a charter, a chapter, sorry, where you do not have a chapter, you would then use the long title and the year in which this particular um, uh, act came into existence and you're going to give the number of the act and the year in which it came into existence in parenthesis. So it simply becomes Companies and Other Businesses Act uh, of 2019, open brackets, act number four of 2019. So that is how you would cite uh, your, your, your acts of parliament. Now, these particular acts, um, you would want to make sure 
being a student of the law, you'd have um, an appreciation of how to cite them. You may meet them in exam situations with or without the commas. Is this correct? Is this wrong? You know, wrap your head around that. Wrap your head around that. Um, if you have to cram, to cram and memorize it, so be it. You have no option there. Now, as far as statutory instruments are concerned, they almost follow the, um, the, the, third, the third type of uh, referencing for an act, where you're going to have the, the long title of the act, and then you're going to have uh, the statutory instrument number, not the act number this time, statutory instrument number of 2021. As shown, I decided to pull the public health uh, statutory instrument on national lockdowns as 2021. We have had many, many lockdowns and um, India is going through a very torrid time. Let us take time to remember them in our prayers. But as for Zimbabwe, the statutory instruments that are there under the public health for the COVID regulations, they are found in SI 42 of 2021 as appears on the screen. Now, um, now when you are now in conversation, I do, I do get myself uh, entangled in some of these things, but you need to memorize this. You have no option. So where you are looking at an act, for example, we looked at uh, the Constitution and uh, we say there is Section 2 and we have Subsection 1, which says the Constitution is supreme above any law and all laws that are inconsistent with it shall be invalid to the level of their inconsistency. Now, there is a second number two, which is in brackets. So that becomes now subsection two. So in subsection two, that's where it says it applies to every natural person, juristic person, on and on and on. Now, it goes on to give your A's, A, B, C, D. Those now become your paragraphs. Those become your paragraphs. So if you have a situation where it's S2, open brackets, 2, close brackets, open brackets again, a close bracket. So if you were to read that, you would say section two, subsection two, paragraph A. And then if you're going to have further items and Roman numerals, those will become your sub paragraphs. Those what you'd refer generally as items. Those would be your sub paragraphs. And we've also looked at statutory instruments. And the same issue also applies. So the first three, uh, so first division, second division, and third division would apply to our statutory instruments where you're going to be looking at section one, subsection one, paragraph A. So that is how you would go about citing your statutory instruments. I hope um, this is going to be helpful, but um, take time to acquaint yourself and I'm saying don't be uh, ashamed to claim. Claim it and then when you are a professor, you can uh, say it anyhow will follow you. But for now, Follow the conventions. That's what it is. You just have to know this one is a subparagraph. This one is a close. This one is an article. Those are the kind of things you will have to know and have. A Under common law, we, we say we have Roman Dutch law and we also have the judicial decisions. Now, you, you, we may not have the Roman Dutch law still churning out new laws. Obviously, obviously. So the Roman Dutch law is what was adopted as it was back then. So it has basically remained stagnant. We can then look at other juries, uh, modern juries, and what they, they have to say about the law. But as far as the Roman Dutch law is concerned, it's a historical piece of law that has remained uh, stagnant, but not necessarily defunct or obsolete. It's still relevant even for our times. Now, it is the judicial decisions that we're going to be looking at in business law. And um, even though we're not going to go into detail on uh, these judicial decisions, but this is just for us to have uh, working knowledge. Of course, in a corporate setup, you're always going to seek um, legal guidance from a practicing lawyer who is then going to guide um, you on how to go about and apply the law. But in this particular incidence, you want to look at what happens in general. So as far as common law is concerned, it is the responsibility of the judiciary to develop this common law. Now, as it develops this common law, it, it, it does so as cases come to it. 
So the constitution, I think it's uh, section 167, provides for uh, the superior courts. That will be the constitutional court, the Supreme Court, and the high courts. Now, these Supreme Courts basically can develop the common law. So should we find a situation where there is a novel case, as Maduku has said, where the law does not cover certain areas, the, the, the court cannot say, uh, unfortunately, uh, there is no law that has been set up on this issue that you are disputing over. Go home and make peace. The, the law is still going to be applied in terms of the natural rules of justice. Common sense. Common sense. So when the judge or the bench now decides and sets up a particular uh, decision, that then becomes the law going forward. But uh, what will then inform this kind of decision? Surely the, the judges will not just thumbs up, thumbs up. They are going to go through the principles of the law. They may also look at that particular act of parliament which does not adequately cover the issues and extend it in keeping with the constitution, by the way, so that it covers those areas because the constitution is believed to cover all aspects of human life. So a constitutional application of judgments basically is an application of the law. So it is not necessarily what we had in the past where the in the older constitutions, the law was what parliament decided. The law is what the constitution says. So the, 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 the judges are going to make judgments wearing the lenses of the law, wearing the lenses of the constitution. And they look through the constitution to come up with those particular decisions. And in making those decisions, there is not every court that would make all types of decisions. For, for interest sake, the constitutional court is only going to decide on constitutional matters or the conduct of the president. Uh, it could be an issue on uh, elections. Um, I, I remember the MTC uh, ZANPF issue that went into the constitutional court. And uh, I think for the first time, we had a televised, a televised um, uh, constitutional uh, process in, in Zimbabwe, in a constitutional court. I think uh, that was um, a, 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 a great leap, a great leap. And I'm wondering when next we're going to have uh, these kinds of televised um, court processes. Because surely, besides them being public, they, they, they are often held in camera. It, it, they, they are too private. Some of us have never been into a court. So you don't want to go into a court after you've been arrested. <laughs> or you have to respond to something, you also want to have an appreciation of the processes. So uh, as far as the constitutional court is concerned, it is the only court that is, um, in fact, let me say the highest court that can decide on issues of a constitutional nature. So in as much as uh, the, the high court or the Supreme Court could give a declaration of invalidity in terms of constitutionality, but the highest court on a constitutional matter would be the Constitutional Court. So all these others can give, um, they can express an opinion on a constitutional matter, but you have the leeway of appealing up to the Constitutional Court. So they, they, they are not the final authorities. Now, as far as being final authorities, let's work our way down. In your sections 171 and 172, 173 of the Constitution, you're going to find that you have the, the Supreme Court being the highest court in all matters that are civil and criminal. So that is how far you would go. You would not necessarily go to the constitutional court on a civil matter unless there are constitutional implications that are, arise and are central to the issue. But otherwise, it will go as far as the Supreme Court and it ends there. So the law, if you were to find it in the high court, yes, it is good law. But better still, on civil matters, if you can find a judgment of the Supreme Court, you can bank on that. You can bank on that. It is almost, almost settled law. Now, these particular um, judgments are expressed in what are known as law reports. So the law reports are published and you can access them. Besides the law reports, you can also even go over to the... Um, 
to the high courts, to the superior courts, because they are courts of record. They transcribe and record everything that, that, that goes on. And when the judgment is made, ultimately, at the end of the day, the judgment is recorded. So you can get there and purchase it and um, have it for a nominal fee. And uh, in these days of technology, there are also some websites where you can go and um, recover or retrieve some of these judgments. Um, you can get these from uh, Zimli. Um, is it? I think it's Zimli. Zimli does give you quite um, a, a good, um, uh, you know, selection of those uh, cases. And uh, just by reading through, you would have a clear appreciation of what the law is. So now maybe you want to say, as you go through these judgments, the court basically develops the law in incremental stages in terms of principles. So it builds one principle on top of another. So as I mentioned earlier, of course, uh, what I've noticed is um, Zimbabwe judgments will range for about 15 to 25 pages. The length is maybe about 30. But uh, in English law, you could get those judgments go for about 40 to 60 pages. That's a lot of stuff to read just to establish what the principle is. So imagine reading through 60 pages only to discover you didn't get what you needed. That can be a torrid task. So what you look for is the reason for the decision. And the Latin word for the reason for the decision, it is called the ratio decidendi. So I've, I've put it this way so that it's easier for us to remember it. The rationale for the decision ratio decidendi right so what is the reason for that decision so what then the court states as the reason for arriving at that decision becomes the principle of the law that becomes the common law that has been set that is what we abide by that is what the court is bound by going forward the precedence as we're going to look at and that now informs how we are going to uh, conduct ourselves so you could have a situation where you have one judge. Whatever that judge is going to say or arrive at becomes the ratio decidendi. Now you could have a situation where you have three or five judges. Usually it's, um, it's an odd number. So the majority, whatever the majority holds, will then be the majority decision. Their finding constitutes the ratio decidendi. Now you would have a situation where one of the judges may decide to go across or two can go in a separate direction. That's very possible. So those kinds of judgments that come from the opposing kind of judgments or the varying judgments are known as the minority judgments. Now, what they give is not the ratio decidendi. They give what is called the obita dictum or the obita dicta in plural form. So like they're dictating outside the orbit. I'm not sure whether this is correct or not, but just for us to understand it in English, there is an orbit and they are dictating outside the orbit, outside the scope. That's how I got to, to understand it in law school. So that later on when you are trying to remember these terms, or Peter dictum, or Peter dicta, why or no, outside the orbit, outside the scope, they're different from everything that is mainstream. So anyone who says anything that is outside the mainstream, that is obita dicta or obita dictum. Now, dictum is singular. Dicta with an A is plural. Now, besides what the judges say as the minority judgments, you could have even um, what the majority judges say and which is not in the ratio decedent, which is not in the principle of the law what they would say as they lead towards establishing the principle. That too is known as obita dictum or obita dicta. So it does not necessarily mean obita dictum is what you're going to find in a minority judgment, in a dissenting judgment. You can still find obita dictum in a majority judgment. Now, besides all these technical terms that we're now using, what is the purpose of the ratio decedent? The ratio decidendi serves to develop the common law. It adds to the law. It informs practice and conduct. 
what does the obita dictum do? The obita dicta influences, it is persuasive in terms of the law. So even though we are not mandated to go by it, or even um, the other courts or the lower courts may not necessarily take that as a law that has to be applied, but they are persuaded to lean in that direction, to consider views in the light of what would have been cast in the obit dictum. So these are some issues that we'll have to uh, look at. So when we go into the judgments that we'll be looking at, it is um, imperative that we know where the law lies and we make sure we are going to exert our energies towards the ratio decidendi and not towards the obita dictum because that one is persuasive and yet the other one develops the common law. So in essence, what the, the, the law does is that it, it, it would basically set up these principles and it, it cannot be overstressed that these principles are going to be set up in keeping with the constitution. And even though the common law is concerned with developing the, um, the law as it weighs, now it, it, it is the practice and the application of these laws as it goes on that becomes the common law, that then becomes a part of the law as it is developed. So to make sure that the effort that has gone into developing this law doesn't go down the drain, what then becomes important is that whatever the decision has been made by a superior court, it would apply to all the lower courts. So if the constitutional court makes a decision on a case and sets up the law, the Supreme Court does not necessarily have to set up another law. It simply applies the law as it has been decided by the Constitutional Court. When the Supreme Court sets up a law on a civil matter or on a criminal matter, the High Court will simply apply that. And the Magistrates Court would also apply what the High Court applies. So what then this simply means is that the prior decision should stand. The earlier decision should stand at all times. So now the Latin term, to explain what I've just been saying, the earlier decision should stand, is called stir decisis. Stir decisis. So the decision should stand. So imagine, decision should stand. Reverse it, stir decisis. So the decisions of the higher courts will always stand. So that is the principle. And the English equivalent is judicial precedence. So where a precedent has been set, it must always apply. However, there are cases where it would have to be distinguished. Um, you know, reminds me of that interesting one where someone said, uh, you know, when they were coming their guests to the extinguished guests. No, 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 distinguished, not extinguished. Distinguished is what is set apart. It needs to be different, needs to be differentiated. So under what circumstances would we then abandon the stair decisis principle? Where the decision has been standing, what would make us say this one is different? Now let us look at some of those decisions and say this one becomes different because of these qualities. In setting apart cases, it's very important for us to say it is the materiality of the facts that determines the turning point. Now, where the facts are materially different, we definitely cannot arrive at the same determination in terms of the law, in terms of the conclusion that we're going to make. So how then do we determine that the facts are different? Now, um, I'll take you back to your academic writing and your essay writing basically at high school. Now, your teacher must have told you that for you to write a good essay, you must write about the five W's. Five W's. What were these, this, the, 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 these W's? And the first W was, who are the parties involved? Number two, what happened? Or how did it happen? Number three, where did it happen? 
Four, when did it happen? Five, why did it happen? Now, when you answer these W's, you would have raised the material issues of an essay. The same applies in the law. When you want to look at the material facts, the question is, if we were to change one of these two, does this result in a different outcome? Now, let's look at number one. Who are the parties? We have already said, in terms of COPIA 2019, that is the act that we'll be looking at in business law, the government is exempt. It is not regulated by COPIA 2019. Uh, we have said employer-employee relations are exempt. They are not regulated in terms of COPIA 2019. So should you have a situation whereby a decision has been made and you want to then apply COPIA 2019, the first question would be, is this a relevant case? The parties involved would determine whether we arrive at the same determination as we did before. What happened? How did it happen? These are some interesting things. Maybe let me uh, just uh, leave this one be for now. We're going to address it shortly in an, in an example. Where did it happen? We're going to be looking at issues of jurisdiction. There are some um, infractions that can be perpetrated against the law. It has been done maybe in South Africa. Can you prosecute someone in Zimbabwe for a crime that has been uh, perpetrated or committed in, in South Africa or in China? Can, can you bring parties from that particular country where this thing happened? So they would want to say, this particular transaction, where did it happen? Those are some of the things that make us distinguish cases. And um, when did it happen? You could have situations whereby um, maybe it's an expungement of a case that happened. I, I know there are people with criminal records during the time of uh, the, pre -co the, the colonial period. And uh, those cases, because of um, the, the rollover, independence came into effect, some of those people would have those kind of cases being uh, expunged, those records being um, taken off by a court order. Now, when those records are taken away, does it necessarily mean anybody else can have their record expunged? Should it then just follow because A had theirs expunged, B who has a crime that they committed in 2020, can they claim that their record too should be expunged? So when it happened becomes an issue. And why it happened? Um, I can think of examples in criminal law. Now you'd have uh, situations whereby um, uh, somebody is sleepwalking. Yeah, this is a typical one. Uh, sleepwalking uh, in their uh, unconscious automation. They commit a crime in their sleep. Uh, they, they step their wife to death or, or they step their husband to death in their sleep. So if it is proven that indeed this person had no intention to do so, that they did so in their sleep. So you, you, you'd want to say, does it then mean everyone who steps their, their spouse in bed uh, should be allowed to walk free? You look at why it happened. Those are some of the things that will distinguish a case from earlier cases. I, I hope you get the idea on material facts. So where does this all lead to? Now, if you were taking this course with um, uh, the intention of um, practicing maybe as lawyers, you'd want to then look at what is known as the IPAC, I-P-A-C approach. So the I addresses the issues. This is what we've been looking at. And then P looks at the principles. A, the applicable law, and C, this must lead us to the conclusion. So the issues must be the same. And the principles that should apply should generally be the same. And the law then that informs our understanding of the issues and the principles put together must then lead us to a conclusion on what the outcome would be. That is how um, you're going to find that your cases are basically designed. So they will basically give you, these are the facts of what happened. This is the principle that is being considered. These are the judgments that have been said on the issue. And finally, this is my finding. This is the finding of the bench. 
So it, it follows that particular layout. But what we want to look at in um, our business law for majors, for business law majors, we're going to look at predominantly the issues and the principles. Now, on the applicability of the, the laws that apply, I would uh, say this without denigrating you. Please do engage a lawyer. Why, 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 why bother yourself with all the cases and memorizing them? Pay someone to do it. That's why you're a businessman. Make money and pay them so that the lawyers can also get an income out of getting the law and uh, applying it for you. But have a working knowledge at least. You cannot just go there and uh, be a blank slate. So when you go there, the lawyer may give you the most relevant cases, but at least have an appreciation of the principle. Because when you get the principles right, you, you, you can get away with uh, not knowing the, the acts or not, not particularly the acts, not knowing the judgments. You can get away with not knowing the judgments of the Constitutional Court and the Supreme Court and the High Courts. You can get away with that when you have the principles right. So this particular course is going to zero in more on the principles so that when you have an interest in going into the law in detail, that's when you're going to have a deeper understanding of the principles. Now let us return to distinguishing the facts with this example that follows. Now, to illustrate how to distinguish facts and make uh, it clear what a material fact would be. Now, let us imagine a situation whereby an ambulance driver who is ferrying a patient from hospital A to hospital B where there is life-saving surgery that has to be done at hospital B and it is very imminent. It has to be done like immediately. Now, as the driver drives over, he has to pass through a traffic regulated intersection. When he gets to the traffic regulated intersection, he finds that the traffic lights are red. He drives past with his siren on. And, um, well, obviously other road users give way as he drives over there. Uh, leaves the um, patient and then the doctors take over. In scenario number two, the same driver let's assume he stays in Bulawayo where water can be unavailable for a week or two, is now driving home. And as he knocks off, he learns that uh, water is now available at his place of residence. And it's uh, scheduled to run out maybe in about 30 minutes or so. Now he drives home and um, he arrives at the same intersection. And the traffic lights are red once again. And he drives past, this time without a siren ringing. And let's assume, as he does so, he is then uh, stopped by our efficient Zimbabwe Republic Police. And uh, they inquire on um, what is happening. And uh, he is convinced that uh, he is the same person who drove past the traffic light and he has done so for the second time in the day, surely the decision that they should arrive at is the same because he's the same person. Now, he, he, he appears before a court. And let's assume uh, the court decides on the first case. The court is going to say he was carrying out his function. His duty demands that he saves lives without endangering other road users. So the principle would be Anyone who is saving a life without endangering other lives in the course of their business can drive past a traffic-regulated intersection, provided they warn other road users. Now, in the second scenario, having established that principle, this driver, I, pres I presume, comes around and says, you know what, in the first case, I was saving someone's life. In the second one, water is a basic need and I haven't had it for the last two weeks. Now I'm seeking to save my own life. So the two cases are similar. I must be allowed to walk away without a fine. So how would the court then go about in distinguishing the facts? Number one, they would want to consider that in the first scenario, the person who did this was acting under the scope of his employment 
in saving lives through an ambulance as a health worker. And in the second scenario, he is not an employee anymore, but he is a citizen, citizen, normal actor who is driving his own car. Secondly, in the first scenario, we had somebody who had been diagnosed, somebody who was critically ill, somebody who was in need of an operation or surgical operation to be carried out. In his case, scenario number two, has he been diagnosed? No. Has anyone established that he could lose his life if he doesn't drive past the traffic regulated light? So that would be material fact. And then item number three, which is material. Remember, he was driving from hospital A to hospital B where attention can only be provided at B, besides his life being under threat. So the issue now we want to look at, is it the only place where water can be secured in Bulawayo? Can he drive to pick and pay uh, or Kmart or Fort Well or any other place and grab five liters of water and get home? Did he have to drive through a red traffic light as if water can only be sourced from the tap in his house? And then another issue that we may want to look at, number four, the vehicle that is being driven. The other vehicle is a, an ambulance. And this other vehicle that is being driven is a personal one. And obviously, maybe his personal vehicle is not fitted with a siren. The first time around, he was warning other road users. Now he's no longer warning the road users because he doesn't have a siren on his car. So the court would look at all these things and say, should we then arrive at the same determination and say he is saving a life? And they say, surely he's not saving a life. He may be fined. He may be imprisoned. So this is how a case would be distinguished. And this kind of distinguishing would then be a scenario where the court would uh, distinguish a case that has been decided at a higher level because it is materially different. So it will not be bound to abide by the precedence, stare decisis. And the court would also vary its own determination because the facts that have come through are materially different. Now, it could so happen that you could have a case where I think it's the Supreme Court that has varied its own judgment, where the case is the case had materially the same facts. So there the, the are limited grounds for a departure from precedence. And we want to look at these and say what is um, an example where we would say it's not an issue of distinct, distinguishing the case, but it's an issue of a court departing from an earlier decision. And this is generally, generally, the preserve of the superior courts. You, you would not necessarily expect the magistrate's court to be departing from earlier decisions, from precedents. Now, let's, let's go on and look at the example of um, Morusi. There is a, a case that was uh, determined by the Supreme Court uh, of Zimbabwe uh, as they were considering... Um, an, an issue, an arbitration issue that had come up with, before uh, a labor officer, basically. And the labor officer, it, it was then held that the labor officer only had two options in terms of uh, SI 137 of 1985. Now, um, the options that the labor officer had was either to order a reinstatement of the employee and or the other option would have been to authorize the dismissal without the option to give um, an alternative to pay damages. So the Supreme Court held that this option did not exist. Now, a year later, the Supreme Court now looked back and said, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. this is not a reflection of what the law ought to be, what the law is on the ground. So it then revisited that. This, this time it was in... Um, I think it was in Hama versus National Railways of Zimbabwe, NRZ. Now, in, in that case, now it went on to say, um, Maduku does give uh, uh, a good reference to these cases. Now, in this particular scenario, the High Court then, I mean the Supreme Court, 
then reversed its own judgment because there was an error in the law. So the, the issue was the labor officer should be able to give an alternative of damages in lieu of reinstatement. So what this means is basically that where someone is to be dismissed and uh, the employer is found to be at fault, if the employer does not wish to have you come back to work, the employer must have the option of paying damages. So this is what the Supreme Court was then setting correct, setting the record straight to say, no, this is the law. So it, it is a constitutional um, imperative for the courts to develop the common law and not to mislead on the law or to reverse, uh, retard the development of the common law. So when the, the Supreme Court now comes back and sets the record straight, it is doing its primary function. So these superior courts can still depart from a precedence where there is a legal uncertainty or there is an error in the law. To correct it, they may depart. But that in all, it is not a, a general uh, practice that we should say is the norm. It's, it's an exception more than it is the norm. A departure from judicial precedence should be an exception rather than the norm. And uh, there should not be many cases where the courts should be wrong on the law leading to this departure, um, where there are no material uh, facts that have varied. So in this particular case, you, you're going to find that the benefits or advantages of judicial precedence far outweigh uh, operations that do not take this into account. So state decisis basically is um, something that is of uh, benefit to both the client, the citizen, the lawyers, the judiciary, and the taxpayers. And uh, Halo and Khan, as quoted by Maduku, uh, ventilate on this. And first of all, they say that number one, it, it enables the private citizen to plan his or her activities, knowing what the law is. Basically, what people do generally, uh, we look at how others have been dealt with and we tend to copy. And um, we see others cross the river to know how deep it is and then we can follow suit. Um, now, it would not be fair for you to watch others cross the road and uh, there are no issues with them, but when it is your turn to cross, all of a sudden, the goalposts change. So we always talk about um, goalposts being changed suddenly. So this is what precedence does. It ensures that goalposts are not changed. And uh, secondly, you know, people would make uh, certain commitments and they, they gain certain rights in terms of the law. So when you have these rights and you hold them because that is what the law is and suddenly the law changes, guess what? When you have a right that has been overtaken by the law, at that point, this is what you call a supervening illegality. So a supervening illegality simply means for you to call, continue holding on to the right now becomes unlawful. So what, 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 what Halo and Khan uh, now are driving across is that the law of precedence, their decisis, would simply ensure that the rights are not dis, dislo, you know, dislocated, you know, extracted and taken away unilaterally. Now, there, there is that assurance. So the law must give us, number one, <clears throat> information. Number two, it must give us that assurance that things will always be that way. And number three, even for those who are on the bench, the, 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 the lawyer, especially, I mean, the, the judges or who, the presiding officer, let me put it that way. The presiding officer, especially at a lower level, is going to find it easy to come up with a decision because all they have to communicate is what has been said before, restated for the current scenario, and substantiated, and, substantiated, and it applies. So it, it doesn't become personal. The, the, the judge cannot be victimized. So you simply write on the type to say the earlier judges have said this. Those who have gone before me have arrived at this determination and therefore this would arrive. Uh, I mean, apply in this case. That is how state decisis will then save the day. And uh, this also even helps in terms of consistency. 
you know, all judges are then going to be viewed to be consistent and impartial because they don't necessarily have to come up with new and unique judgments all the time. They simply apply what has been decided before. And uh, number four, it also serves time and hours in terms of the court. That's the taxpayer's money. Because judges, the judiciary is paid using the taxpayer's money. So imagine a scenario whereby the courts are going to spend uh, uh, months on end. Um, I'm not going to talk about other commissions that I've seen run for years. Now, you, you don't want to have a scenario where taxpayers' money is being used indefinitely. If a case has been decided before, all that the, the court would do, they simply say, this is the case, this is the answer. Within an hour, you're out. Done. Out. And people wonder, you mean tell me you're done? Because of judicial precedence. That's how those cases can be decided in a shorter space of time. And besides, from the bench perspective, even for the lawyers, the lawyers who give you the advice on whether to litigate the matter or go to court, their duty is to study the law and apply the law. So when you come in, you are going to be the client in this case. You are not the lawyer. So you expect your lawyer to know the law and your lawyer to give you the sound advice and simply tell you, if this is the case, you have a weak case. There is no, um, the prospects of success here are very slim. So where you have been advised and you choose to pump out money and still go that way just to satisfy your ego, surely uh, a fool and his money are soon parted. So you cannot throw your money down the drain. So what this does is that <clears throat> basically it helps the lawyers to advise and tell you if we're to go to court with this case, the prospects of success are slim. Why? Because of the stair decisis principle. So when you are there, you're basically going to put in a clever question to your lawyer and say, um, are there cases that have been decided for this particular kind of reasoning that you're advancing. And while you're at it, are there cases that have been advanced or decided for, I mean, against the kind of reasoning you want to put across? And if there are such cases, it is not wise for you to proceed because the principle of state as the decisis is just going to stand in your way because the prior decision has to stand. That, that cannot be done away with. So in summation, what do they then say? They say um, these are the direct benefits of um, judicial precedence. Um, number one, certainty. Number two, predictability. Three, reliability. Uh, four, equality. Five, uniformity. And lastly, convenience. These are the principal advantages of having state decisis in a system. Certainty, that we know what the law is going to be. Predictability, it shall be so for the foreseeable future. Reliability, it will stand. It is sure. It is guaranteed. And the other issue is equality. The law is going to treat all persons alike of a similar situation. Remember, distinguishing of the facts on material cases. But where all things are the same, ceteris paribai, all things being equal, the law is going to treat us the same. And it must also have a uniform application. It should not vary from one person to the next. And lastly, convenience. It must save the taxpayer's time, save the taxpayer's money, save the court's time, save my time. Those are some of the principal advantages that are cited. And uh, I had to come up with an acronym. I'll leave this one to you. Uh, how you are going to remember and internalize this. Certainty, predictability, reliability, equality, uniformity, and convenience. Make sure you commit these to mind. They may be required of you someday soon. The third um, source of the law that we can uh, look at is custom. Um, as far as custom is concerned, there are two types of customs. There is custom that refers to the general practice and custom as in customary law, African customary law. This is now law that has been legislated, by the way. So 
in, in, in as much as it would um, fall under A on X, it can also come to C in terms of practice. These are your customary uh, practices like, um, let's say, payment of ilobolo, ilorora. That's, that's, that's a customary practice. It is regulated in terms of the law, uh, the African customer law. But uh, you may find that it would vary depending on um, the type of uh, marriage chapter that you used. Did you use the, um, and, uh, chapter five marriages or use the customary marriages? So that is where it will vary. But otherwise, where it is an issue of practice, um, that is where this custom is going to be much more pertinent. And there are four distinguishing issues that would determine if a custom should be accepted as a source of the law. And the first one is that it has to be reasonable. And there are some customs that are not reasonable. So it has to be reasonable. And the test of reasonability is a discussion for another day. But uh, issues like uh, your payment of interest, you know, interest payment was not a, a legal issue. It was a custom issue that was uh, applied over time up to a point that it was deemed to be a reasonable practice to say when you take someone's money, uh, borrow or you have a loan, uh, surely you must pay an interest. And eventually that custom became legislated, as I said. So it, it ceases to be a common law issue. Now it's a legislation issue. That is why we have the prescribed rate. I think it used to be about 5%, was it? Uh, at most, I think it went up to 15% uh, for the prescribed rate. So this is uh, one of the features that you want to look at. Is it reasonable? And for it to be reasonable, it must be reasonable according to the standards of the common ordinary man. Common ordinary man. And number two, we want to say, is it long abiding? Abiding, abiding. Um, has it been in practice for an established period? It is not something that we just thought of today. Now we're saying this is a custom. So it must have been there for, for quite um, a long time for us to have used it and gotten used to it. So these are not just your morality kind of uh, issues. These are the kind of customs that will impose an obligation on the other. They, they, they would really make it um, mandatory for you to oblige and do something in return. And uh, thirdly, it has to be uniformly observed. So you cannot say it is a custom and it is just in your head. You have just thought about it and all of a sudden it becomes a custom because you have decided so. No, it, it must be uniformly observed by parties involved even in the locale, in the community where people live. So these are some of the things that we want to look at. And lastly, it has to be certain. So it, is, it has to be clear. It, it cannot be um, an ambiguous uh, statement that we are going to try and say it has become a custom. So if, 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 if there are expectations that are set, they have to be clear. And... Um, these are the things that um, when one has in the bag, for, for them to be enforced, you, you would not seek enforcement in terms of a legislation. This is where now you're going to approach the court for enforcement. So when you approach the court for an enforcement and the court now rules in your favor, the custom now becomes part of the common law. So it, it doesn't become a part of the common law because it is reasonable, it is long abiding, abiding, um, and, and, and uh, it, it is certain or it is uniformly observed. It, it is not just those four that make it the law. What makes it the law is that it must then be enforced by the court. So remember Maduku's um, uh, definition of the law is the enforceability that makes it the law. So the, the fact that it is reasonable doesn't make it the law. The fact that it has been done for a long time doesn't make it the law. The, the, the fact that it is long abiding doesn't make it the law. The, the, the fact that this particular uh, I, 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 item that we're looking at is certain and many people do it still doesn't make it the law. It only becomes the law once it is enforced. And it is the courts that can enforce the law, 
Now, this leaves us at our last question. Uh, it's been a long day. Let us look at to whom do these rules and regulations, these laws apply as we wrap up for the day? Now, um, as we look at the application of the law, in as much as the law, the constitution in a sense, applies to everyone, you, you may find that the law would not always apply everywhere and to everyone. So we need to be alive to this. We, we spoke about the law, the Roman Dutch law, as it applied in the Cape of Good Hope in the 1800s. That's what was assimilated into Zimbabwean law. So that is the applicable law. But um, the Roman Dutch law of the Cape of Good Hope was not, you know, uniquely a Roman Dutch law. The English also came through and they brought in English law, especially as far as contract law is concerned. And now it, it became um, a, a laced, uh, I, I wouldn't want to say laced because it would appear as if I'm saying English law is poison, but it, it, it was a, a blend. It's, it's a hybrid. It's a mix. So, so what we refer to as Roman Dutch law is not actually your pure Roman Dutch law. It's your, I would say, Roman Dutch, in parenthesis, English law. That is what we then siphoned, and it came with the colonizers into Zimbabwe. So what we refer to as Roman Dutch law as being applicable, it is the law as we assimilated it at that time. Now, this particular law, you will find that it is um, the law that would apply in many other jurisdictions. I think uh, South Africa uses that same law. Zambia could be under the same law. These are some of the jurisdictions that use the same law. So we, we are under the same um, umbrella in the ambit of, the, of that law. But it does not necessarily mean because uh, South Africa uses Roman Dutch law, uh, the law in South Africa becomes the law in Zimbabwe. No, 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 no. There, there is still an exception that would apply by virtue of jurisdiction. So, Zimbabwean law is not Botswana law. It is not Malawian law. It's always going to be Zimbabwean law. So, in as much as the constitution demands that we need to take into account um, the laws from other nations, and it is actually demanded of the judges that they must be abreast in terms of the development of the laws, internationally and regionally. So, that can be the law in the bigger sense but there is the jurisdiction where the law applies. So the law in Zimbabwe is not the law in Namibia. And the law in Africa is not the law in Asia. It's not the law in the Americas. Maybe it's not even the law in the Commonwealth. So by virtue of these uh, jurisdictions, you will have to find that the law would not apply wholesale. The principles may be the same, but its applicability is going to vary. And even when you go into the acts, this we've already established before and we shall state it again. So the, the, the certain acts would apply to certain types of people or persons. And some people will be exempt. And, and I'm still going to go to Copier 2019 and, and, and state that uh, Copier 2019 is clear that it does not apply to the state. It does not apply to employees. Um, look at uh, your CPA 2019. It applies to transactions that are done within Zimbabwe. So this is the applicability of the law. It is not a wholesale application. But um, as far as the obligations of the Constitution in terms of um, Section 2, uh, Subsection 2, and um, I think, uh, yeah, it, it should be Subsection 2. In, in terms of in that kind of a setup, the law would apply generally. But all things being equal, the law never applies generally. So it is the responsibility of the business law student to make sure you know which law applies to you. And particularly which statutory, statutory instruments apply to you. Because that is where the rubber meets the road. So you, you cannot spend the whole day studying the constitution. Yes, yes, it does affect all these other I mean, operations within the entity. But you want to make sure you are alive to the very things that address the nuts and the bolts of the practice. And you'll find those in your what? 
in your statutory instruments. If it is your your employment issues, you find those in the collective bargaining agreements, the CPAs, those are the things that you're going to be using every day. So make sure you you have those, you know, and you know them like the back of your hand, like the back of your hand. Now let us recap. Let us recap. It's been a long day. What have we talked about? First of all, we have looked at um, the question, who makes the rules? And we looked at rulemaking. And we said there are two sources of the rules and regulations that we have. Number one, the legislation. And who is the legislature? Parliament. Number two, president put together, they make up the legislation. And they do all this legislative work in keeping with the constitution. Who else can make legislative regulations? It is those who have received delegated authority. And what kind of legislation will they make? Statutory instruments or bylaws. So this is the first arm that makes the rules and regulations that apply. The second arm is the common law, judiciary, judge-made law, judicial precedence. Who makes the law? The judges on the bench. How do they make the law? By stating a principle that must govern the law. And where do we find this principle? It is to be found in the ratio decidendi, the rationale for the decision. Secondly, what is the other issue that we looked at? The sources of the law. Where do we find the law? We have established that number one, you're going to find the law in the acts or in the statutory instruments. Secondly, you're going to find the law in the judgments or law reports. And you're also going to find, this is the common law, by the way, you're also going to find the law in the Roman Dutch law as articulated by the jurists of old. And thirdly, where are we going to find the law? In the customs. Custom and practice. And in custom and practice, remember the four issues that you have to look at in order to determine that this particular custom and practice is uh, applicable. And in our law reports, we also looked at there is a responsibility to make sure that all the decisions of prior sittings of the court, they will stand. And it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, a decision that has not been reported should not stand. No, 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 no. It's a decision of the court. As long as it's a decision of the court, it is binding on the lower courts. And the same decision can be distinguished depending on the material facts. And the decision can be departed from. Stare decisis may be suspended only where it is a matter of an error in the law that has to be developed, corrected, or properly stated. And at number three, what did you look at? Application of the law. And we have made, stated that the law would not apply to everyone everywhere. It will vary from one jurisdiction to the next. It will also have exceptions from one act to the next. And lastly, having discussed all these about the legislature and the judiciary, you know, we are looking at the pillars of government. We've said the legislature and the judiciary form the body of the law, but the law lacks hands. The state becomes the hands, the long arm of the law that catches and arrests, the long arm of the law that protects and nurses the citizens. That is the rule of law. Now, did you know that um, actually heaven has the same pillars of the law? As you read Isaiah 33, the verses 22, it reads as follows. For the Lord is the judge. The Lord is the lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. What then have we established here? If the Lord is our judge, God is the judiciary. If the Lord is our lawgiver, God is the legislation. If the Lord is our king, God is the state. All these three are encapsulated in God. Now we need, because we're human beings, a separation of powers. We cannot have a situation whereby the state is influencing decisions of the judiciary. The judiciary has to be independent. We cannot have a situation whereby the legislature is making laws that are contrary to the constitution. Then we need the judiciary to keep them in check. 
So all these systems need to counterbalance. That is the power of sovereignty and democracy. Now, before we go our separate ways, let us recap on what we have covered so far. It's been a long day. The first issue that we sought to address is uh, who makes the rules and the regulations. And in response to this, we have highlighted that, number one, it is the legislature. And the legislature comprises of parliament and the president. Now, as legislature discharges its functions, it does so in terms of the constitution. Those are sections 116 and 117. In your sections 116 and 117, it would make regulations for the sake of POG, Peace, Order and Good Governance, POG. And that besides, legislature can then delegate its functions of um, lawmaking to uh, subordinate authorities. This could be the president, the um, uh, ministers or municipalities. These would then subsequently make statutory instruments. And all these statutory instruments are going to be made in keeping with section 134 of the constitution. Basically, it must be intravise the constitution and not ultravise the constitution and the parent act. That besides, all other acts and statutory instruments should be intravise with the constitution. On rulemaking, we also learned that there is the common law. That's the second leg that makes the rules and regulations. And in English law, this is referred to as judge-made law. And this is the law as it is developed by the courts and even as judicial precedents demands that there must be a consistency of the application of these principles throughout the courts and the lower courts. Now, this principle is going to be found in the ratio decidendi as articulated by the majority of the bench where there are more than one um, judges sitting and the minority would give us the obiter dicta. And um, even the majority, besides the ratio decidendi, the reason, the rationale for the decision, besides the ratio decidendi, whatever would have been stated leading to this principle is their obiter dictum. And all these, when you look at them, they are persuasive, while the ratio decidendi is binding. At number two, we sought to address where can we find the law. And uh, this one was more extensive. First of all, we established that you will find the law in the acts and in the statutory instruments. And we also looked at the acts as in um, how you would cite them. Zimbabwe uses option one and option number three. Option number one, long title of the act plus the chapter. Option number three, long title of the act plus the year when it was gazetted and then the number of the act and the year again in parenthesis. If you're going to use the short title, long title of the act, comma, and the year of gazetting. Now, as far as referencing these, when you are now referencing them for the acts and the statutory instruments, they all use sections. The next uh, determiner is a subsection. The third determiner is a paragraph. And the fourth determiner is a subparagraph. This one applies to your acts and does not apply to your statutory instruments. Now, as far as the applicability of uh, these, they have the same force and effect at law. And they may be accessed from the government printers. They may be accessed online. Zimbabwe is going on to the online stage. Now you can access these acts and statutory instruments online. The other place where you can find these is uh, the common law. And as far as the common law is concerned, we said there is the Roman juris, the law as it applied in good Cape of Good Hope in the 1800s. That is one. We did not spend much time on it. But there is also the law as it is uh, articulated by the judges in the law reports. That is where you're going to find them. So the law reports basically are the primary sources of the common law. And the law reports, particularly the ratio decidendi, 
the principle that should apply. That is what you'll be looking for. Of course, there is the law as articulated by the Roman juries who wrote during those times. And you could also even look at the modern uh, legal minds. As they write, they also express what the law would be. And these are persuasive um, write-ups uh, that you'd look at when you have exhausted basically your acts, statutory instruments, and your precedents. So if all these do not apply, then you may want to go to the Roman juries and go to the modern academics and what they say about the law. Then we also looked at custom. And under custom, we differentiated the two types of custom, the African customary law, which is uh, legislated now. So that one would go into item number one, uh, African customary law, but there is the custom and practice. And we gave four examples of uh, custom and practice where it would apply before it is enforced. Reasonability was one of them. It must be long a binding. Uh, I almost say a binding, right? It must be law a long a binding. I think I'm tired. It must be long a binding. Yes, yes. It must be long a binding, and it must be reasonable. It must be uniformly applied, and it must be clearly stated. It must be certain. Number two, number two, we spoke about the sources of the law, which may be split into four broad divisions, which are legislation. Uh, and uh, you can look at the common law as well as um, under the common law, the various sections that will apply there. On legislation, we say there are acts, there are statutory instruments. And under the statutory instruments and the acts, we went even as far as to how you're going to reference them and cite them. On referencing the, the acts, we, we mentioned that there are three types of references that would apply. And the first reference is where you have the long uh, title and the chapter, companies and um, other businesses, entities, uh, chapter 24, uh, in parenthesis. And then the second one, that would be your copia, comma, 2019. And the third one, you're going to have your um, long title, the year, that would be comma, 2019, in parenthesis, number so and so of 2019 that is how you're going to use those and zimbabwe uses the first one and the third one as for the second one in a zimbabwean context if you want to use the short title you would make sure you have your 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 comma before the year and uh, as far as um citing these we we stated that um, you would need to make sure that you take note that the first division would be your section the second division will be your subsection. The third division will be your subparagraph. And uh, it will be your paragraph. And the fourth division will be your subparagraph. And then um, turning to number two, the common law. As far as the common law is concerned, we looked at um, number one. There was the law as it applied in the Cape of Good Hope in the 1800s. And then there is the common law as decided by the judges as they sit on the bench. They develop the common law, and we say it in English law, this is referred to as judge-made law. Now, these uh, judge-made law, what we'll be looking at are the precedences. Make sure the precedences that you're going to pick, you're extracting them from the ratio decedendi, the rationale for the decision, and making sure these would apply in the principle under that says... Um, the previous decision must apply or stay decisive. All these that apply are applicable. The decisions that are given by the majority bench would apply. Those that are given by the minority would be persuasive, just like your minority judgments. Now, all, all these are going to be accessed from the law reports, and you can always get these um, Either you can purchase or you can pay for the printing expense from the court or you can access these from the law reports or you can access these online from Zimli, as I had mentioned earlier. But uh, that besides, it does not mean if a judgment is not um, reported, it is not um, applicable as far as state decisis is concerned. It is still applicable and binding. And um, the other thing we looked at was the issue on custom. On custom, there was the African customary 
uh, law, which would apply in uh, under the X and uh, statutory instruments section. But the issue we looked at was custom in terms of general practice. Before it is enforced by the courts under common law, judge-made law, there were four parameters that needed to be recognized. Uh, off head, I can think of one. There is need for it to be reasonable. Number two, long abiding. Uh, number three, it, it has to be uniformly applied. Number four, it has to be certain. These are some of the issues that need to be considered before one can say this is a custom and practice. So that becomes another example of the law and where we can find it. And thirdly, we also looked at the application of the law. To whom does it apply? It applies to unique jurisdictions. The law from one country to another would vary. Number two, within the acts and the statutory instruments, there are exceptions. There are some who are not going to be covered by those acts and they are not going to be covered by those statutory instruments. So it is your responsibility as a student of the law and a business major to make sure you understand which laws are applicable. But above all, what we have covered is that you will notice we said there is the legislature which has the responsibility of peace, order and governance. There is the judiciary which has the the, 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 the the responsibility of ensuring that justice, substantive and procedural justice is served at all times. And then there is the state, which is the arm of this body of law and legislature, gives it the power and the means to execute. Now, the separation of powers gives us these three pillars of state, legislature, judiciary and state. Now, you know, I, I, I was fascinated as I read Isaiah 33 verse 22. He says, for the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. Notice the judge representing the judiciary, lawgiver, legislature, king, the state. All these three come together. It's only God and God alone who can hold them in one hand and be trusted with all three. But as far as the operations of the law are concerned, these have to be separated because we are human we cannot be trusted with objectivity. We need checks and balances. Only God and God alone can operate in this way. Let us invite his presence, even as we call it a day or a night. Let us pray. Kind and gracious Father in the heavens above, thank you, dear Lord, for the privilege of having considered the law. You are our judge, the lawgiver and the king. Dear Lord, your laws are timeless. They need no amendment. They have stood since the test of time. And dear Lord, we pray that these laws may come into our lives and we may order our lives accordingly. I pray for those who have taken time to go through this study. As we have gone through this conversation, may you remind them that which we have studied and even above all, take care of their families and their loved ones. In Jesus' name we've prayed and asked. Amen. God bless you, my friends. Till we meet again, blessings and peace.